Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for our Tip Talk Tuesday. I'm very excited today to have some two special guests. Uh, just to start off, my name is Andrea Millers with Endogastric Solutions uh, and this is a live event. So um, at any time, if you have any questions for our special guests today, please feel free to type your comment uh, or question in the comment section and we will do our best to answer all of the questions. Today, we have another familiar face. I'm not sure if you remember, we have Dr. Amar Thassani. He is a board certified gastroenterologist and therapeutic endoscopist um, that has over 20 years of experience in the medical field. His practice focuses on complex en endoscopic procedures of the biliary system, pancreas, gastrointestinal cancers, and esophageal disorders. He utilizes in minimally invasive approaches to many gastrointestinal diseases that previously required invasive surgeries. Dr. Thassani is currently the Director of Advanced Endoscopy at Honor Health in Scottsdale, Arizona. Welcome, Dr. Thassani, again. Thank you for having me. Of course. Uh, in addition to Dr. Thassani, we have his uh, general surgeon, if you will, uh, his name is Dr. Sam Durrani. Uh, Dr. Durrani is a general surgeon who completed his training in general surgery at Mount Carmel Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio. He moved to the Valley in 2010 and quickly established his thriving general surgery practice with special interests in pancreatic, endocrine, and, endo and oncologic oncologic, excuse me, surgery, and advanced therapy, uh, advanced techniques in hernia repair. Uh, Dr. Durrani is the Vice Chief of Staff at Honor Health Deer Valley and is currently serving as Chief of the COVID-19 Task Force for the Honor Health Network. Dr. Durrani is known for his caring bedside manner and his operative talent. So welcome, Dr. Durrani, and thank you for being here today. Thank you. Happy to be here. Wonderful. So uh, we're here to talk about GERD. Um, I know uh, in, we kind of had a previous talk about um, GERD and hiatal hernia, and that's why we have Dr. Durrani here today. So before we start in going into kind of surgical um, aspects of uh, acid reflux or GERD therapy uh, treatment options, Dr. Sonny, do you want to talk a little bit more about what is GERD? Um, explain kind of the mechanical problem or the, the kind of symptoms, typical or atypical symptoms a patient could potentially feel if they were suffering from GERD. Sure, of course. So GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease is basically um, when a patient has contents from the stomach come up into the esophagus. Um, and the the stomach makes gastric acid, which um, which has a very low pH, and when that comes up in, into the esophagus, that that's the pain that that people feel, um, and it can be either a burning or a discomfort. Um, you know, when you eat something or you lie down flat and you feel that 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 acid coming up, that that's because um, the esophagus is that doesn't have any barriers to um, preventing pain from this highly acidic contents. And, and that's basically what, what acid reflux is. Um, and when you actually look at what's causing acid reflux, it, it is a mechanical problem. Um, normally the esophagus has a barrier at, at the lower esophagus called the lower esophageal sphincter that um, is closed and it prevents the contents from the stomach to come up into the esophagus. So it's normally closed. When you eat food, the food bolus, it, it'll open up the sphincter, food will pass through, and then it closes again. And the problem with GERD is that this mechanism, which is a very complex mechanism, is not functioning properly. Um, and, and because of that, the material in the stomach, it's, it's, it, can, it, it has a chance to get into the esophagus. Um, and there's multiple factors with that, which um, uh, do you want me to go into them now or should I let Dr. Durrani take that one? Sure. E either one of you, if you want to talk about, uh, you know, the kind of symptoms, typical and atypical symptoms a patient could potentially um, suffer from. So, so, so just, just a little more about the symptoms, then we'll talk about the anatomy with uh, Dr. Durrani. So, you know, the, the typical symptoms of acid reflux, um, the one thing is the feeling of pain in the ch in your chest, burning in, in your chest. Um, 
um, it, it can almost mimic someone ha ha uh, having having a heart attack. Uh, regurgitation is a typical symptom where where you can actually you know you feel like you're you're almost vomiting a little bit and and there's stuff coming up a after you eat. Um, some of the more atypical symptoms, um, chronic cough is an atypical symptom. Um, la laryngitis, um, you know, um, especially coughing at night because when when you lie down and the acid comes up. Um, th those are those are atypical symptoms. Some people can get such bad reflux that they can get sinusitis and and and, and other upper respiratory infections. So th those are uh, more of the atypical symptoms. Perfect. Thank you. And currently, uh, you know, what are you kind of initially telling patients uh, to do to manage their bird? For example, uh, you know, are there certain activities or their lifestyle modifications that they should do initially prior to even looking at a surgical option for treating? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, when, when someone has GERD and, and, and it's first starting and it's mild, um, the first thing that we recommend is, is some lifestyle modifications. Um, I, I'm not sure if I believe in a lot of these, in all honesty. You know, people say avoid acidic foods and this and that, but, you know, the pH of your stomach is already so low. I'm not sure how much benefit that plays, but without a doubt, for, for, for certain people, there's certain foods that, that, that just trigger them to to um, trigger their acid to come up in, in, into their esophagus. So um, monitoring what you eat. The other big thing is um, is the quantity of food that you eat. Um, you know, people that are having acid reflux, we, we often um, advise them to uh, to eat small, frequent meals. Um, you know, the bigger the food bolus that you put in, the more chance it is that, that your stomach is going to be full and that's your reflux. Um, and another big issue is not eating late at night because you don't want to eat and then lay down right away because if you have food in there and, and if you lost this barrier to reflux, the food will come up into your esophagus. Um, so those are the main lifestyle choices. That, that I usually recommend. In terms of medications, you know, there, there's there's multiple different medications out there. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would say, um, you know, people can start with like with Maalox or Tums or any of the other ki kind of coding medications. That, and if that helps it, great. Um, you know, then then um, one of the more popular medications were H2 blockers, Antac. Unfortunately, now they've been taken off the market because of the way that they're compounded and, and, and there's a risk of a carcinogenic agent in them, so you can't find them anymore. Um, and, and then after that, um, the most common thing are what's called proton pump inhibitors, which are medications like omeprazole, Nexium, Dexalant. These are medications that actually turn off the, um, the pump that secretes acid into the stomach. Um, and and they are effective. They're they they are effective for reducing the the stomach acid. And then what happens is people are still refluxing, but they're not refluxing a content that's as acidic. So you don't feel symptomatically. You don't feel it um, because your esophagus uh, it 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 can sense the acid. But if you lower the acid, you you know you won't have the symptoms. But it actually does nothing for reflux. You're still refluxing. Right. Right. So because we do have Dr. Durrani here, um, it would be really great. Um, and maybe you can preface this, Dr. Thassani, uh, by talking about, you know, most of the patients that do uh, do, do get the tip from you guys, um, there's a high percentage of patients that have a hiatal hernia. Um, and so maybe we can talk about the anatomy and, and you know, the lower esophageal sphincter versus, you know, everything that's happening above that. So this is a perfect opportunity to discuss that part. <laughs> Dr. Durrani, that's you. you. Take it. <laughs> <laughs> that's your cue. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I usually see, you know, these patients that are suffering in their end stages of GERD, right? I mean, people don't want to have surgery. It's a last resort. But, you know, really, uh, surgery is something that is uh, phenomenal at recreating the anatomy that you were born with. Uh, your God-given anatomy is to keep your acid in your stomach. So, it's essentially a valve um, that's created by the diaphragm, uh, a valve that keeps food in your stomach and it keeps acid in your stomach and it keeps you from refluxing and allows food to go down. So surgery involves recreating that valve. Um, a lot of times with living life, we gain weight, you know, pregnancy, uh, a lot of things happen and that, that, that muscle like any other muscle or opening in your body can weaken and you can develop a hernia. Then the stomach starts slowly sliding up in the chest and you lose that natural barrier to acid and food coming back up. So a very, very common symptom 
is acid reflux, like Dr. Tassani said, and regurgitation of food. By the time I see these patients, they're so badly damaged in their esophagus, they all they progress to dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, and things like that. So I'm, you know, we're kind of reaching out, hopefully getting some attention brought to surgery and surgical options because earlier intervention will prevent some of these delayed progression in disease that we're seeing. And some people can develop cancers, um, Barrett's, Barrett's esophagus, acid washing on the esophagus and causing inflammation is not a good thing. So the, so surgery is corrective and instantaneous. Um, we basically pull your stomach back into your out of the chest into the abdomen, we close up that, tighten that diaphragm up and uh, create a valve in some way. And now there's two ways to create a valve surgically. Um, you can do create, recreate the valve from the inside, which is the TIF procedure or externally, which is a Nissen procedure. And there's benefits that we can talk about to the TIF. Yeah. Why don't you um, kind of talk about, uh, you know, the Nissen was the gold standard for many years. Can you talk about that a little bit and then we can kind of um, talk about the differences of how TIF work and um, the benefits and for, for either and both, if you will? Well, when Dr. Dasani came to me and wanted to start doing TIFs, you know, I, I didn't want to fix anything that wasn't broken. And Nissen's a great operation. I mean, my patient's satisfaction with a Nissen is very, very high but they all complain about bloating and things like that because we make things super tight. Their reflux goes away instantaneously. You know, people that are having trouble at night sleeping because acid is waking them up. They feel like they're drowning in their own acid. You know, that gets fixed immediately. Even if we do a Nissen too tight and they can't get food down, nobody wants me to reverse their Nissen. They don't touch the Nissen. I don't want my reflux to come back, right? So, you know, when he initially came to me, I was a little bit skeptical, like, why do we want to make a better mousetrap here? You know, people really are happy with the Nissen. But, you know, people do get bothered by some of the symptoms of having too tight of a valve, right? Uh, the swallowing difficulty, we have a lot of that and a lot of bloating. You won't be able to belch or vomit after you have a Nissen. And that, you know, if people get sick, you know, it's going to come out one way or the other. So, um, you know, people... Now that we've started doing TIFs, I've noticed that there is a benefit to allowing some of the air to go, you know, when you're belching and you had too much in your stomach, that bloating feeling to release that sensation on, of pressure from your stomach, there is a benefit. So I think that this is going to be the, the way we're going to move towards in the future. Fantastic. And you've been doing, uh, you've been partnering with Dr. Thassani for a, a, almost a year now, right? Doing uh hydrohernia uh, repairs and TIF procedures combined, right? Correct. Yeah. And I've been 15 years and just started doing TIFs for the last uh, mm -hmm. year with Dr. Thassani. And, you know, it, he's changed my mind on it. So Fantastic. Well, Dr. Thassani, Thassani, this is a perfect opportunity to talk about TIF and how it works and let our viewers know how the TIF procedure works. And, and then Dr. Durrani, if you want to um, maybe come in and talk about the differences. I mean, you did kind of say it's an internal versus external building of the, the valve, but um, as you go through it, you can maybe point out some differences if there are any. Sure. So I, I think um, the biggest thing, the biggest difference with the TIF versus uh, Nissen fundal glycation um, is that when, when the surgeons are doing a Nissen, they basically take the top of the stomach. So if this is your esophagus and this is your stomach, they take the top of the stomach and they wrap it around the bottom of the esophagus and, 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 and they basically tighten that, that sphincter area by, by using the stomach on itself, wrapping it around the esophagus. And then they, then, then they, then they sew it, they pin it to, to, uh, together there. And, and that creates a valve. Um, and as Dr. Durrani said, it, it actually works fantastic from a symptomatic standpoint. It, it works great, but it's the side effects that, that, that a lot of people don't like. Um, so what we do with the Nissen is that rather than touching anything on the outside of the stomach, we work on the inside of the stomach. There's a lot of tissue um, at the top of the stomach where the esophagus and the stomach meet. And we basically take that tissue and create a valve um, right at the bottom of the esophagus, but on the inside where we, we, we create about a three centimeter valve and we take this tissue, we mold it in, in, into a valve and we twist it. So we were, we're creating an anti-reflux valve on the inside of the stomach. Um, and, and that, that, that allows us to achieve, um, the same benefits that a Nissen does in terms of anti-reflux without a lot of the, 
um, more complex uh, complexities that, that that occurs with with, with surgery. You know, doing doing it um, doing it surgical when, when you do an ischemia. I mean, Dr. Johnny can speak to this, but the surgery it, you you fix the hernia, meaning you bring the stomach down through the diaphragm back into the belly. You fix the opening in in the diaphragm, and that that part of the surgery is is the easier part, I believe. Um, it's the missing right where you where you have to do a lot more work. And dissecting out the top of the stomach, that that makes it a little more challenging. Not 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 terribly hard, especially with with a skilled surgeon like Dr. Durrani. But it, it does it does make it a little more challenging. And then when when we do the TIF, you know, the surgeon doesn't have to do any of that. They they don't have to dissect out the top of the stomach there after they fix the hernia, and we can do everything on on the inside. I think an important thing to remember is that you know the anatomy that you're born with is not your stomach wrapped around your esophagus. You know, the TIF actually mimics more the natural anatomy that you're born with and creates that you're, that the valve angles that, that you're born with. And there's certain angles that you want at the, di at the hiatus or the, the opening of the, the um, diaphragm that you, that you can recreate internally, which mimics more natural God-given anatomy rather than a, you know, distortion of the anatomy where we wrap the stomach around the esophagus like a fist that's basically holding acid in into the stomach very tightly. So it's a more natural recreation of the anatomy I, I, that the TIF provides. Right. Uh, we have a, a quick question. I want to make sure we get to this question. What does TIF stand for? TIF. <laughs> I'll let you answer that. <laughs> Transoral incisionless fundoplication. So transoral meaning we're doing it through the mouth. So so um, you know our part doesn't require any cutting. Um, if we just if we're just doing the TIF, the surgical part may, could, could be different. But so we go through through the mouth, transoral, um, in, incisionless, no cutting from for the for the TIF part. Um, fundoplication meaning making a wrap, wrapping either wrapping the the, the stomach in such a way to create a, a valve. Perfect. Thank you. We actually do have quite a few questions that are popping up. So if you don't mind, I'm going to go to the questions and we'll answer some questions and then get back to what we were um, going to. So if I take, if I have surgery, uh, this is from Lee, if I have surgery, do I have to take medication forever? Right. And that's actually the, um, the, the thing that, that we're trying to do with, with, with this, with fixing the, the, the valve is, um, you know, I, as, as I said before, I, I'm, I'm not a believer in taking medications long-term for, for reflux. If you start taking omeprazole or Nexium, if you look at the labels of all these medications, they, they tell you to take it for 14 days, right? And we, we all have patients that have been on these medications 10 years, 20 years. No one thought it, it, it was that big of a deal, but over the past four or five years, we, we've actually seen um, a tremendous number of side effects that are being related to these medications, whether it's increase in cardiovascular disease, increase in stroke, um, bone demineralization, kidney issues. So, so w whenever you're taking a medication for the rest of your life or long term, I mean, there, there are there, there's a high chance that you're going to have some side effect. And as I said before, the, the medications aren't really doing anything for reflux. So no, the goal of this uh, procedure is to get people off of medications. Um, with all, all of my patients, we, we basically do the procedure and I have them take their um, anti-reflux medication for about 10 to 14 days after and then stop it. I, I don't, the, the, the goal is to not have them ever take a medication again for reflux. Right. Uh, we have a question from Adrian. You did address this a little bit, but maybe you can get back, go back to it a bit. Um, is GERD an acid or hyperacidity issue, or an anatomical mechanical problem? I, I believe it's an anatomical mechan mechanical problem. Um, if if you if you remember uh, science chemistry ca class, there there's a pH score, right, which tells you how acidic things are. Um, so the pH of one is basically the most acidic environment, and the and a pH of 14 is the most basic environment. So the pH of your stomach is somewhere between one and two. You know, you can't really get much more acidic than that. You could, you know, you can drink a can of Coke or a cup of coffee or something acidic, and you're not really doing much to lower the acidity of your stomach, right? It's, it's, it's an extremely acidic environment. Yeah, even if the stomach was producing greater amounts of acid, the reason it should be washing on into your esophagus. And that's the actual problem when it comes to GERD is we need to keep the acid in the stomach where it belongs, even if, you know, based on when, when, when you eat, the stomach produces more acid. You know, you eat, uh, you drink wine, you have a steak, you're going to produce more acid, right? So 
it's important to that that delineates that the anatomy is the important thing with reflux especially perfect thank you uh sabrina is asking if my ppis work some of the time would i be a candidate for this procedure if i didn't want to stay on medications absolutely um, as as so the the one thing about reflux is that before i before I offer a TIF, um, either just purely endoscopic or with Dr. Durrani doing it surgical, you want to make sure that that it is really acid reflux that 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 is your issue. You know, the one problem um, with acid reflux is that if you go see a doctor, um, whether it's a primary care doctor or a gastroenterologist, a surgeon, and you tell them that you have burning in your chest and reflux, it's almost a knee-jerk re reaction to put people on these anti-reflux medications, and mo m uh, most times that 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 is what's happening. But but there are a good number of cases where it's actually not reflux that's causing your symptoms. So before we we do this, we we actually look for some objective data um, to make sure that that this is reflux. Either looking at imaging studies to to see is there a big hiatal hernia. Um, I, I often do endoscopies and put in what's called pH monitoring probes where I can actually see how much acid is coming up in, in the esophagus. We, we, we do look for, for, for data to, to prove that this is acid reflux. Yeah, that's a really good point, Dr. Thassan. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the workup or the diagnostic testing that you do prior to even determining whether or not a patient is a candidate for the TIF procedure? Yeah, sure. Um, um, and, and again, it's probably a little bit different from the gastro and intestinal arena versus this, uh, you know, if you go see a surgeon first. But normally what, what happens is, is people get reflux, they go to their primary care doctor. And then after a while, they're still having reflux or, or, or they just they're not happy with medications and then they get sent to a gastroenterologist. So wh when a gastroenterologist sees a patient with reflux, for, for the most part, if it's bad enough, they're going to get an upper endoscopy or they'll put a camera down into their mouth through the esophagus and, and into the stomach and look and see what's going on. And we're basically looking for damage at the bottom of the esophagus. We're looking for a hiatal hernia or the stomach riding above, uh, above the diaphragm. Um, we're, we're looking for any, um, any severe damage from acid in the esophagus, like what's called esophagitis or something called Barrett's esophagus, which is a precancerous change. Um, and, and then the other thing we're, we're looking for is how much laxity there is at, um, at the level of the diaphragm where, where the esophagus is coming through. Now, as I said before, it, sh it should be really tight there, um, but a lot of times we see it's just wide open, it's gaping open, and I can, you know, we can almost bring the scope, like, you know, like flip the scope on itself and bring it back up into the esophagus. So the, those are the things that, that we're looking for with that initial, um, with that initial upper end endoscopy. Um, the next thing in, in the workup, if we're unclear if it's acid reflux, acid reflux or not, um, we, we normally, or I, I normally implant a pH pro, something called a Bravo capsule um, that goes about six centimeters above the, um, the area where the stomach meets the esophagus and stays in for 48 hours. And, and, and we ask patients to stay off all of their anti-reflux medications, and we can actually calculate how much acid is coming up. And the patients carry this little monitor with them, and when they feel like they have acid, they press a button, and then we then, then we try to make a correlation. Um, when they eat, they press another button to see you know see is food making it worse. So that that's one um, that, that's one thing that I do that I do a lot of because as I said, I I, I want to prove that this is acid reflux, and you and I I don't want to do any anatomy altering procedures that really, you know, you very difficult to reverse. If the endoscopic way you can't reverse, the Nissen you can reverse with difficulty. Um, so so we want to make sure that that we're doing the, the right thing. Now um, when someone there's a couple things that 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 we can find that we actually don't need to do all that. You know, if, if someone ha has bad reflux and someone does what's called an esophagram or an x-ray where they swallow some contrast, if they have a huge hiatal hernia, meaning a lot of their stomach is up above their diaphragm, you know, you really don't need a whole lot more. Um, you, you know it needs to be fixed if they're symptomatic, and that's when, when, um, when patients go directly to, to surgeons um, to fix these problems. Okay. Uh, any other uh, testing, Dr. Durrani, that you would do if they came to a general surgeon? Yeah, so like I said, you know, when people come to me, it's like they're at their wit's end and their their esophagus are very, very badly burned for a very long period of time. And an esophagus is just a muscle. 
And if you burn that long enough, it's going to weaken and stop working. So I may send people with large hiatal hernias that are having difficulty swallowing for what's called a manometry test, where they it's a very uncomfortable test where they put a probe down your nose into your esophagus and they check how well your esophagus works by having you swallow. The last thing we want to do is make a, everything tight and you don't have a strong enough muscle pushing food down. So it, there are, you know, and this is where a TIF can come in come in play since it's not as tight, you know, it would it could be a better alternative to someone that has esophageal damage potentially. Um, we can do partial wraps where we're not doing a full Nissen fundification or, um, you know, a TIF if, if your esophagus is very badly damaged. Mm -hmm. um, so most of the people that come to me are having some difficulty swallowing. Like I said, we see the worst of the worst typically. The surgeon. Okay. More questions. Rajesh is asking, Dr. Zoe was put on Asifex 20 milligrams about a month back as I was on Omeprazole 20 milligrams for many years. However, I've noted since the switch, regurg regurgitation of the food ingested happens quite often as also the burning sensation. Please advise. Is that normal? Is that, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> you know, that's the thing. That's the thing about all these, uh, all the anti-reflux medications is that yeah. some of them work for some people, some not for others, you know, and, and there's really no rhyme or reason to it. Um, in, in my in, in my experience, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give some patient omeprazole works great. You know, if I switch from the next team for some reason, now it doesn't work anymore or, or vice versa. So I, I don't know any correlation with um, increased regurgitation um, with, I, I think he said he's increased, he, his regurgitation is worse with the next team or with the, uh, with the ass effects. I do think oh, it's. Now he's now he's on aspects. So what what it could be is that for whatever reason the aspects is not controlling the acid as well. Um, but regardless, you know, as I said, the the medications don't do anything for regurgitation. Whether you're feeling it or not, you're still regurgitating, right? It doesn't do anything to to fix the the ana the anatomy to prevent regurgitation. Yeah. No matter what medication you take. Yeah. And regurgitation for me is more a sign or symptom of a hiatal hernia because food's not passing through the stomach. It's, it's getting trapped above the, the diaphragm and then you're bringing it back up. So it, I would advise that an esophagram to potentially see if he has a hiatal hernia. Yeah, perfect. Uh, uh, okay, so another question from Shane. Will I be limited in exercise and activity levels after the TIP procedure? Depends. Um, yes. <laughs> if you're doing, if you're doing a straight endoscopic tip, or if you're doing, if, if you need a hiatal hernia repair with the with with the surgeon, um, if you're doing a straight endoscopic repair, you know there's not a whole lot you can do to to cause damage. But I I do ask my patients to not exercise heavy for for a week or two. Um, you know, no heavy lifting. Um, there, the biggest thing is a dietary change. Um, and if they if they're having a joint procedure where, where they're having their hernia repaired, Dr. Drani, I guess you you can answer that. Um, what, yeah. What are your, how are your patients? Yeah. I mean, it's a hernia, and when we fix hernias, we also place mesh down, usually biologic, at that in that area. We're, we we want to give it some time for that scarring to occur with the mesh. And it sounds like Shane lifts weights, so it would probably be a good month to six weeks before you could get back to lifting weights. I typically tell my patients any type of hernia, anywhere in the body, um, nothing over 10 pounds, 10, 20 pounds for about six weeks. Six weeks, okay. Uh, another question from Kim is, uh, are there any size limitations of the hydro hernia that would disallow a patient from receiving TIF? No, because what what actually, actually so so um, all right. So if someone has a small hiatal hernia, meaning uh, two centimeters or, or less, I, I can actually do it fully endoscopic because I I can I can reduce a small hiatal hernia with the endoscope. I can push the esophagus and the stomach back down and make the repair. Um, if, if the so so that that would truly be an incisionless meaning. You know, I would bring you to the endoscopy suite. There's no surgery. There's no cutting open of you know, there's no no incisions in, in the abdomen. I do the whole thing through through the mouth. 
Um, but if the hernia is above two centimeters, really, really patients are, are, are going to do better to fix the defect in the diaphragm. And, and that and that requires surgery. That, that's when, you know, Dr. Durrani and I would go in and, and, and I would bring he would bring the stomach back down into the abdomen and that hole in the diaphragm, he would make it smaller. He would repair the, the hernia. Um, so, so really the cutoff is, is two centimeters, less than two centimeters. I could do it fully endoscopic, bigger than two centimeters. Really, you should, you should have, you should have a joint surgical, uh, procedure. Great. Anything else to add, Dr. Durrani? Yeah, I just want to say the majority will have a degree of a hiatal hernia. It's just a question of how big, um, it, it just happens to everybody over time. Uh, I think I, you know, I'd ask Amr how many people that he sees, Dr. Thassani, that don't require a hiatal hernia repair. Yeah, I, I would, I would say the, um, the majority of the, of the tips that I do, um, majority we're doing them in conjunction with, with, um, with Dr. Uh, Durrani because, um, you know, you know, as you said, one of the biggest drivers of of an abnormal uh, anatomy at the at at the that's causing reflux is a hiatal hernia. You know, and and that's when people are really getting this bad reflux. You know, when they have a big hernia, and 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 there's just no barrier to keep it. So I, I do think um, the majority of the patients are requiring a joint procedure. Okay. Uh, another question: What if you had the Nissen done before and it slipped? Can they get uh, can they get it redone, or or is the TIF procedure a procedure? I, I I personally love this operation for this patient, right? So we've actually done quite a few. Dr. Tassani and I have done recurrent uh, hiatals or um, slipped Nissen fund applications that slip back up into the chest. And what we do is I I bring everything back down to its normal position. Now the stomach's already wrapped around itself, so before TIFF, we would just try to tighten it up and it was kind of like you know, eyeballing it to see if we could do it. But now with TIFF, the Nissen doesn't prevent Dr. Thassani from doing the TIFF. So we fix the hiatal hernia, bring the stomach back into its normal position, and then Dr. Thassani can go in and do the TIFF. We've got excellent results with that. Wonderful. Yeah, right. it, it actually yeah. makes it a lot nicer and a safer safer operation because then, then the surgeon, Dr. Electroni, that doesn't have to take down the old you don't miss in or do anything more to right. it. You know, he, he, he fixes the hernia, he fixes the defect, and then, then we do everything on, on the inside. And right. the, the inside is not really changed so much with, um, I mean, it's changed a little bit, but but it's not changed enough that, that, that it prevents us from doing a TIF in there. Right. Yeah, fortunately, I don't have a lot of patients that have recurrent problems after Nissen, but there are some from other surgeons that I see, you know, that <laughs> that um, that I always recommend this this route would be the best way to, to repair it. You know, it's like the def definition of insanity, doing the same operation over and over again, expecting different results. So I think this is the perfect niche for the, those people, those patients. Yeah, that's the point. We actually had a patient, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, and she had... I think two or three Nissens, and then finally got the TIF procedure. Now she's she's doing yeah, right. So, yeah, interesting. Uh, so uh, another question I do have. See, Rajesh again is asking. I do have a hiatal hernia spot uh, in the doc. So doctor, thank you. Um, and they're asking, will the TIF really help? So <laughs> he's he's yeah. <laughs> With the hiatal hernia repair, it's important yes. that you know the 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 hiatal hernia is addressed as well. Perfect. Uh, we did talk a little bit about um, exercise post-op, but can you give us a, um, a little bit more detail on what post-op looks like? M maybe um, there's some questions here that I'm seeing about the diet, what that looks like, um, how long are they on liquids and whatnot, if you don't mind. So for exercise, I'll take exercise. You can talk about, about diet if you want, uh, uh, Dr. Fasani. But um, for exercise, you know, I, I don't restrict exercise. Cardio is great. Getting up and moving around after surgery is great. You're not going to really feel like doing much for the first week or so, but I want you up and moving around, walking as much as possible. People usually get back to light activity like jogging, golfing, things like that after, after about two weeks, you know, getting on elliptical on a bike after about two weeks. Um, and then I typically, for diet, um, I will keep them on just liquids for about two weeks because there is swelling around the areas that we do. So we, we don't want to, you know, introduce food and have it get stuck in that area. So we're really cautious. So we just, I, I personally keep my patients on liquids for about two weeks. 
Uh, Dr. Tassani can talk about what his regimen is. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty much the same. For the first two to three days after, it's strict, um, you know, strict liquids. You know, no, you know, I don't want any any thick liquids, nothing. It's just liquids. And then from three days to two weeks, it's liquids, but it can be a little bit thicker liquids, like shakes and stuff like that. Um, slowly after um, after two weeks to six weeks, you you start reintroducing foods. And 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 really, from from what what I recommend in my um, um, in, in the handouts that, that, that I give to patients, it's really about six weeks of dietary change. So the, the one thing that, that a lot of patients actually um, say to me, and most are actually happy about it, is that, that, that they lost a lot of weight, you know, <laughs> after the hiatal hernia repair, which, which, in, which in reality actually helps with your reflux too. So, um, yeah, so, so it, it is, you know, there, there is, some some definite di uh, dietary restrictions for for the initial six weeks. Right, it's not a weight loss surgery, but uh, people lose about fifteen to twenty pounds average just from being on the liquid diet. Do they gain it back when they start eating? When they start? Well, that's up to them. <laughs> <laughs> I can't control what they put in their mouth. <laughs> okay, so another question just popped up from Stefan: Is the Hill procedure partial or full more effective than the Nissen procedure? You know, um, for a toupee or, toupee or different type of fund application, it's kind of an advanced question. There's different reasons we do different types. Um, you know, it really it's really patient specific. It depends on your age, your comorbidities, how, what degree of dysfunction of your esophagus. You, those are kind of higher level questions. It's a good question. Um, but, you know, there's reasons we do partial wraps. I typically on younger people that are healthier will do a full wrap versus a TIF. Um, someone that's getting a partial wrap, um, you know, that does not preclude them from getting a TIF. I would probably go the route of a TIF first because it's it's not a wrap at all, right? It's an internal kind of stapling of the stomach to create a valve. Um, so, you know, it, it, there's there's different reasons we do and they they're, do different types. And it's really patient specific why we do what we do. Perfect. Uh, so this is the kind of elephant in the room, um, the, the idea of COVID, is it safe to um, come in and have these procedures, this type of a procedure uh, during COVID? And then uh, there's another question that, you know, do you guys do telehealth uh, appointments as well? You want me to take the COVID question since? Since you're the chief of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, you know, um, we run the COVID uh, task force for Honor Health uh, medical staff. and. We look at the numbers every day. Um, you know, the numbers are what they are. They're concerning. And when you have patients that are, have COVID, we definitely want to keep them away from our post-op surgical patients. They're cohorted separately in the hospital. Now, if there's a crunch, um, we, like I said, we watch the census and the, uh, of COVID patients every day. And if we have to proceed with surgery, we will cancel surgery. Now, we're very aggressive about canceling surgery because we never want to put any of our patients in danger. Luckily, uh, the, the hiatal hernia and TIF patients usually spend one night in the hospital, whereas the COVID patients are long-term convalescing patients that stay in the hospital an average of eight days. And they're usually in higher level of care places of the hospital. So we can keep separate areas of the hospital very clean and COVID free. Every patient that comes in for surgery will get a COVID test um, to make sure that, you know, we're, we're not bringing COVID into the hospital. Um, the visitation policy is a little bit stricter with COVID, but I, I would not bring my patients to an unsafe environment. And it's kind of why I became, you know, part of the, the task force to make sure that we were doing everything right and protecting all our patients and our physicians and, and nurses that are taking care of COVID. So that's a great question, but we will be the first to tell you when it's unsafe and we will cancel surgery. Perfect. Thank you for that information. And doctor, uh, what about um, telehealth, you know, for kind of initial consults, are you doing that right now in your practice, both of you? you? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I do. I, I do almost hundred percent of my, my, uh, my office visits now are telehealth. Oh, okay. Okay. I have to see my patients in the office because of, you know, incisions and looking at wounds and stuff, but initial consultations can certainly be done over telehealth. Fantastic. Wonderful. Uh, so 
um, kind of wrapping up here, is there any um, recommendations or any uh, anything that you would like to add if we didn't cover it in regards to, you know, patients advocating for their own um, health, especially with, you know, GERD symptoms? Uh, is there anything you'd like to uh, conclude with before we uh, end the program? Yeah, I mean, that, that I, I'm a strong proponent in anti-reflux measures, you know, um, so, so reflux is such a common problem. I think something like 80, 80 million Americans are, are on these acid reducing medications. And, and, and to me, I mean, if, if you're, if you're symptomatic, if you're still having symptoms on these medications, and you're taking these pills every day, you know, and, you know, I, I would definitely reach out to someone to have some type of a anti-reflux procedure done, whether it's full surgical and having the Nissen fund application or endoscopic, having a TIF or endoscopic plus surgical, having one of these joint repairs. But I, I would I would really try to get off of the medications because, you know, again, I, I can't stress enough that, that the medications don't do anything for the actual problem. They're just putting a bandage on it. So if you're really symptomatic, you know, you, you don't have to suffer from it. You know, you, it, it's something we can really improve people's quality of life. And um, and and uh, and, you know, they people feel feel better. So. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, one of the highest, the highest satisfying surgeries that we do because patients get great results, their reflux is, I take my patients off PPI day one, uh, mm -hmm. off of medications day one, because there's no need for it. We fix, essentially fix the problem. So I, you know, I wouldn't just stand for getting pills thrown at you. There are other solutions to the underlying medical problem. Perfect. Thank you. And a patient could see a GI specialist and or a surgeon, right, for, for the TIF procedure. So they can either contact you, Dr. Thassani, and, and to your point, Dr. Durrani, I think you see kind of the patients that are at the, hot, the worst end of it after. You can come still come see either one of right. you to get diagnosis. Right? Correct. And part of it's education on me and Dr. Thassani's part, educating our colleagues to colleagues, and we have been working on doing that, educating the gastroenterologist that, hey, you know, don't let these reflux cases go that far out before you send them to us. So we are doing a better job of getting to see these patients a lot sooner that need help. That's wonderful. And again, you know, the purpose of our TIF Talks is to also educate the community and the, and the consumers and patients out there, um, especially the ones that have been suffering for a very long time, that there are options out there. And, and we've got for physicians that specialize in, in the treatment for GERD. So I can't thank you guys enough for joining us this evening. Um, we, re, we at Endogastric Solutions really appreciate it. And I answer the people that are watching appreciate it as well. So um, again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And please, everybody, stay safe. Uh, if you're in the Phoenix area uh, or Scottsdale area, you can um, contact Dr. Thassani or Dr. Durrani. Um, but if you're not, uh, you can go to GERDhelp.com. Uh, on there, there is a lot more information about GERD and the TIF procedure, as well as the physician finder. And you'll be able to put your zip code in there and find a physician that does the TIF uh, procedure in your area. So thank you again uh, for joining us. Uh, have a great evening, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.